This video will continue the sample solution for the marble run exercise. In part two, we're going to finish out other parts. In this particular video, I'm going to focus on just the other fabricated parts and then separately deal with uh, inserting the dowel pins and export to DXF. Um, this is going to be recorded in kind of real time as I draw it for the first time. I haven't rehearsed this, so I, there may be some bits where I edit out a little sound, uh, a little, little video just to keep it moving along. Um, but this should be a fairly honest rendition. As before, I'm going to primarily address the thought process for parametric design, um, incidentally talk about Fusion, 3, uh, Fusion 360 specific operations and features, but not going to really dwell on like specific mouse clicks and things for Fusion 360. So here's where we left it. This is the design of the play field at a tilted slope. And if you recall, there, uh, there was, um, in, in change parameters, we had set up some high-level parameters for variation. So the goal here is to draw the remaining parts from the sketch, which is the foot and the central strut and the side barrier, as fabricated drawn parts using in-place modeling, um, and have them be associative to the existing features so that if I modify these parameters, then they will adapt as needed to compensate. So let's go ahead and come back into our part. And um, first thing, I'm just going to go ahead and get started here. So uh, new component. Let's do the foot next. The foot is just going to be the, the footprint on the ground, the base plate that supports it. So I've started a new component. And um, at this point, I'm going to show you uh, kind of a convenient thing, which is I can right click this component and select isolate, um, which will just hide everything else. Oftentimes in a multi-body system, that's the easiest way to get started on something. Uh, unfortunately, it did actually hide my um, top-level sketches, but I can actually bring that back if I need to see that. That'll help give me some scale. So on that, we see that we did have a little bit of a, of a, of a designation for uh, the part dimensions in the form of that, that dashed box that we drew at the top level. And we can reference that to use that for part of the feature here. So now that we're in foot, I'm going to go ahead and create a sketch on the ground plane. Uh, and here we're going to uh, create a, an elliptical foot. Um, just going to first just sort of drop it down, and then we'll do a little fix-ups here. Okay. Oop. Okay. Um, I'm just going to try to pin dimensions here by saying it should be, let's say, uh, 50 millimeters wide. That doesn't seem wrong. And I'm going to do something I might have done sooner, which is to take the original sketch line and project that. On my keyboard, the P key is bound to project, because I use it so often, and uh, project that into my current drawing. It does come in as, a, as an actual solid line. Sometimes it's convenient to make sure that that is actually a construction line, um, which if you can pick the right line. And here's another, another Fusion 360 sketch trick. If you uh, hold down while selecting, you get a menu of possible uh, uh, items at that point. So it's possible to pick something hidden. And then I hit the X key to make a construction line. So the purple line is now dashed. That just saves a little bit on the way that the regions are, the, the profiles are defined. There won't be as many split profiles this way. So I can go ahead and my, my center line for my ellipse, I can define that to be uh, uh, collinear with the uh, central line that I had drawn before. And I can go ahead, actually, that was sort of redundant because I'm going to go ahead and uh, take the endpoints of my ellipse here and make them coincident with the endpoints of the previous uh, uh, the line feature. So that'll make the length of the ellipse uh, equal to the length of that feature at the top level sketch. Uh, which just keeps that dimension in a locating place. Here's another trick. If I hit F6, it'll bring the current uh, items into, into view nicely. It's a way to kind of just relocate yourself on the drawing. Okay, so there I have a basic ellipse. And are there any remaining freedoms? It's marked, it's funny, it's marked in blue, but I don't believe there's any remaining freedoms. Uh, now it's marked in, so I don't, I'm not quite sure what's happening there. Okay, let's go ahead and um, actually, for, for a subtle change of pace, in, in previous sketches, I have done the outer contour and the tab slot separately. But this part is so simple. I don't see a reason not to go ahead and create my um, slots for my tabs all in one go. Then I have simply one sketch that controls the whole part. It's a convenient way to um, just get this done. So I can go ahead and create a rectangle here. I didn't mean to create that as dash lines. I can use the X key to just convert those back to solid lines so they'll be a real feature. And I'm, I'm going to just dimension it individually here rather than tie it to anything. So dimension the width at 6.2, as we've been doing, dimension the length at 15, uh, and zoom back out. Um, also, if you click on faces of the little view uh, uh, box, you can get you can jump immediately to different view uh, points. That's actually very convenient. Here, we have a center line in the ellipse, so I might as well just do this uh, as a mirroring operation. So if I create a mirror, 
and I pick the, the lines of the box that I just created here, and the mirror line I pick as the, as the central line. Well, actually, that's actually funny. It's, it's, it's not allowing allow me to stick it as a, as a wonder. I think it might be a special line. I, I can fix that here by just creating another construction line that is, that is coincident with that line. Hopefully that will work slightly better. Also, I think I missed one of those being solid. Okay, is that a no? Notice we, the reason it's blue is we haven't actually located its position. We're going to do that separately after the mirror. So we're going to re try to repeat that mirror, pick my side lines, pick my mirror line here, the elective this time. So I guess the, I guess the central axis of the ellipse isn't treated as a center line. That seems a little inconsistent. And I get a mirrored feature. And now that I have it mirrored, I can actually dimension the center to center distance of this. Actually, I would need a center on this one, won't I? Okay. Yet another, yet another construction line. Construction lines are super useful for uh, allowing you to do specify things as you like. That may also be useful in a minute. We'll see for creating the corresponding tabs. Having the central line exist is generally a convenient feature. Okay, so there we go. Let's just make it 75, keep things in multiples of 25. Okay, so we have, a, we have a, effectively a profile now that we can actually extrude to the final form. So when I go and I, I pick the face here and I hit you know, my keyboard, it's E to extrude. I can type in six millimeters, and um, the profile was smart enough to figure out which was positive and negative space, and it gives me a all in one step a elliptical foot with some conveniently placed slots for tabs. Um, now if you recall, we were still in this isolate mode, which turned off the visibility of the playfield. We can actually just turn it back on again here using the the controls in the browser, or I can right click and find unisolate, and that will do the same thing and bring it bring it back to, vis to visibility. Now, I'm still, remember the foot is still the active part, and that shows me that the foot still has the active design history. That's why we're seeing just the single sketch and extrusion. I want to go back now and select the top level you know, file of the root of the tree in order, in order to be, have the whole design active. And I'm going to hit F6 again to bring, bring that into view. Okay, so now we can think about that central strut. And I can already see that I haven't thought this through very well. There's going to be kind of a very wobbly structure with only a single strut. So we may have to fix that after we draw it. So let's create another component for the central strut, and uh, we'll call it strut. In big assemblies, it's important to have good names here. This is basic enough. And we can use now, because of that, we know that this X, the, we have a plane right here. The YZ plane is our symmetry for the whole thing. We can use that as our drawing plane. And then this time, we're, when we do the extrusion, we're going to symmetrically extrude it around it. So that will truly be the center line of the plane of the part. And that just turns out to be, in this kind of symmetric design, a really convenient way to specify where the part sketch goes, right along the midline. So I'm going to, um, strut is active, I'm going to select that part and say create sketch, and we get a side view. And for now it is, it is kind of handy to leave everything else visible, and let's just kind of get the contours right here. Um, so I'm going to want to, uh, oops, I might want to clean side view, there we go. Um, so I'm going to want to uh, just think a little bit about how I, have, I want to have a tab uh, in the bottom, a tab in the top, a tab at upper, and a tab on the bottom. Four tabs and some structure between them. So I'm just going to go ahead and start to draw in. I'm going to draw it actually a little bit more just in space this time, and then we're going to fix it as we go, um, just to kind of make that that clear. Sometimes it's actually it is important to think through how you're going to um, how are you going to log what, exactly what you're going to associate a feature to? So sometimes being extremely deliberate about where the associations go uh, helps you to get it right and not to associate this, the sort of an... There are sometimes multiple features and you associate to the wrong one and it just causes troubles later on. So um, I'm kind of just, again, mostly working on getting the sort of the general um, structure of the part right without worrying too much about the... Um, the details. And, and I'm going to tolerate some long face contact. That'll help keep things rigid. I think I drew with a curvier shape, but we can always fix that later. For now, I'm trying to just kind of get the, to, the overall topology right. Okay, so that sort of is at least the general topology of how our part should look. And now we can think a little bit about exactly which features should be related to which. So we're going to just start making some things collinear. Uh, we have a sketch axis from the previous part that we can make collinear to that. And I have chosen to make it collinear to the sketch feature. I could have used the projected edge of the part as well. Um, this is probably produces the same outcome. It's mostly a question of habits here. Notice that my tab's kind of inverted when I did that. Um, 
right? Here's where you get to watch me kind of just sort of fumble for a bit as I can get things right. And you notice there are some like default uh, constraints that, that Fusion 360 decided on, like there's a right angle there that I'm eventually not gonna want. That parallel is innocuous. And um, okay, so let's now think about now how we get the tabs lined up because those are really the critical features here. So uh, if nothing else, I wanna make sure that, um, sorry, this line here was supposed to be the shoulder of the tab. That's not perpendicular. This should be collinear and in some sense doing, and this should be, this shoulder should be collinear and this shoulder down here should be collinear. Okay, so now at least we have the, the basic form of the critical features in place and we can kind of still drag around some details. Let's focus on one of the tabs to start. And I'm gonna just sort of arbitrarily pick this upper top back one here as the kind of reference feature. Get our, our general shape kind of lined up right and then think through how we're gonna actually detail out the, um, why is that not, okay, sorry. All right, here's a case where I could easily imagine editing out a little time later on. Oh, I got rid of a, of a coincidence constraint I actually wanted. So much of CAD ends up being thinking of ways to do things efficiently. So what I really care about here is uh, getting the center of my tab to fit into the center of the slot. To accomplish that, I'm gonna actually take the original center point from my slot and project that into my current drawing. That'll give me a feature that I can use. And I'm gonna make a construction line, which is attached to that point, which will be, and then that construction line is gonna be uh, perpendicular to my edge. Make that perpendicular to my edge. Okay, so now I have a line around which I can center the tab. And that gives me some places to start detailing the tab. First, I'm going to uh, use a midpoint constraint to say that the end point of that line should be at the midpoint of the face of the tab. That'll lock down the tab sort of location. And now I'm gonna go ahead and dimension the tab. Now, one of these details of laser cutting is my preferred habit, and this is, you know, choices may vary, is to try to draw things more or less at um, uh, final size, although I will sometimes make slight tolerances where there's kind of force fits. So drawing this at 15.2 means it'll probably cut at 15, and then the tip of the tab will fit into the slot, which will be slightly oversized at about 15.2, but the root of the tab will make a, make a press fit into the slot. And this is just kind of a formula that works, making kind of a wedge fit of a slot into a tab in six millimeter plywood. It is material specific. So now the next dimension we can think about is the idea that this, these edges should have a subtle angle um, to make the wedge. So I'm gonna dimension that as an 88 degree angle, so it's two degrees of slope per side. And then to finish this off, um, you'll notice that the depth is gonna be set by the material, like the six millimeter length of the tab is actually coming from the other part. And then the only remaining thing to get right here is I can create a symmetry constraint such that the inside corner of one root and the inside corner of the other root are symmetric around that center line. And that fully defines the tab. And what we'll see is it will slightly intersect the 3D model of the other part. And I'm basically anticipating the fact that one will cut undersized, one will cut oversized, pounded together, they'll fit nicely. And that comes from experience with the material. And it shows you that the CAD system uh, will show you exact 3D shapes, even if they don't quite reflect the final reality. Finally, I'm going to just sort of choose a length for this shoulder, just to make sure that it doesn't vanish by mistake. It's, you want to have a little shoulder here. I'm just going to say three millimeters to give me a little bit to pound into. It's a little bit of a sharp outside corner, but we can always fix that separately. But that guarantees I have some face there, so when I pound the tab in, there's a fixed face that will encounter the other back of the other part and create some concrete depth. Okay, that done. I'm gonna detail the other tabs. I'm likely to edit out a little bit here just to save you on time because you don't need to see me repeat the same thing three more times. But I'm gonna let the camera roll. Okay, so we're back after I've done some drawing off camera just to save you the time of watching me sort of fumble through a bunch of, of operations. But let's look at where we are. So I fully detailed all four tabs using the same scheme as before. And I can temporarily turn off the play field and uh, the, the, the foot just to make this more legible. And what we can see is I have uh, four tabs, each has the same kind of tab width and a subtle uh, wedge angle with a little shoulder defined. They're all located with respect to the features on other parts. So the overall location of these is gonna be associative with changes to the other parts. And then there are some re redundant uh, wedge angles here I didn't try to, to limit. But there are relatively few numbers on this drawing. So at this point, if I go ahead and finish this sketch, 
uh, we, we can see we have a complete profile. That's, that's uh, one profile for the whole part. And I can hit E and extrude that. Now this time, if you recall, we are right on the center line. Like the, like the plane of the drawing is the midline of our part. So when I go to do the extrusion, I'm going to pick uh, two sides symmetric. And then here I'm going to specify that the whole length will now be the six millimeter uh, thickness of my material. And so that, that creates a three millimeter on each side extrusion uh, symmetric around that midline. And my drawing is effectively right in the central plane of the part. And I get a new body. So that's a strut. That's a viable part with wedges that will fit in. It's got some sharp corners that are not beautiful, but we could always come back and kind of beautify it later with either additional cuts or going back and modifying some of the straight lines into curves. So let's let's think now. Let's return to the top level, activate the whole thing, just bring back our bodies for a second. Uh, like I said, this we're going to end up fixing this the rigidity of this. That's a little bit wobbly to have a big plane resting on just on one strut, but we can always add a part to fix that. Let's think about these side barriers. They pose a slightly different challenge because they're at a funny angle. They're kind of no, not, not parallel orthogonal to any existing plane. But we do have a line that we use as a reference plane for creating another drawing. And once again, we'll use the midline. So if I pick that line that was through the center, you'll notice now that plane would, by default, be in the plane of the part. But if I make it at 90 degrees, I'll get a plane that is perpendicular to the ground plane, but through that axis, right where our uh, side barriers should fall. And we can use that as the basis for a sketch. So that is a piece of reference geometry that I created at top level. And if you look in the browser under construction, you'll see now there's a, there's a couple, this is the most recent extra plane that we've created. Um, so that's a top level feature. So now I can create a new component for the barrier. And we're gonna draw it once and everything is symmetric. So we'll be able to just duplicate it for the other side. And um, now that's active by default now that we created it. I'm going to pick the new plane we just created and say create a sketch on that plane. So our process is going to be fairly similar to before. Um, this time I might try to reduce the amount of fumbling with uh, uh, the, the sketch by drawing a little bit more exactly where I want it to begin with. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, bring, I'm going to find that line that was the kind of center line at the top of the previous of the other part. And I'm going to project that into my current model because I know I'm going to need that. I also know that I'm going to need um, the center lines for the tabs, because those are useful. I'm going to project those in as well. And I could have done this as one projection, but sometimes I just do the projections one at a time. And I'm going to try to find the midline here for the other slot. And then just as a reference, um, I might as well also bring in the part edges. If I find the actual edge of the part here, I can, I can project that into my drawing. And it'll come in in some funny, actually, that's actually not as useful as you might think because it's not perpendicular to the plane. It comes in as a line segment. So that's actually not going to be excessively useful. So now I'm going to go to a, a straight orthogonal view and I have my reference geometry. I'm going to just turn off the, the visibility of the other parts just, just to avoid confusion. And then also to avoid confusion, I'm going to take this and make sure it's a construction line so I can really see it. Now the, the, the lines, the cross lines from the slots, they're perpendicular to the plane I'm drawing on. So they came in as points. So you know there's a point there and a point down here, which are the center lines for my tabs that I'm going to end up creating. So just to get going though, let's just think about creating uh, the overall geometry. And this time I'm going to actually just start with it kind of more in place to reduce the amount of fumbling with changing things. Fusion 360 will in try to infer, um, try to infer uh, sketch features and sketch constraints as you go. And sometimes it gets it right, but sometimes it just involves a lot of undoing what it's, what it's selected. I'm going to come up here. And then I'm going to hold it down to get a curve, holding the mouse button down as I draw this line to get a curve, just to sort of go ahead and put the fill it in kind of right now. And I'm going to let it sort of snap to a parallel because that seems like a reasonable point. And hit it. Then I'm going to hold it down again to do another curve here, and then finally close the line segment there. And I'm letting it, I'm letting it assume the perpendicular to the line. So this way I'm drawing it a little bit more exactly where I want it by kind of carefully selecting what geometry I have visible to control what is used as a reference uh, for the geometry. So now when I go ahead and draw the tab, I'm drawing it a little closer to its final shape off the, from the get-go. Um, come up here, we're gonna stop a little, I think I somehow stopped drawing there. Okay, moment of fumbling. There's always a, lot, a moment of fumbling here. Let's connect that up to there. For some reason, it, keeps thinking and starting a new line. I'm not quite sure why it's doing that. Uh, draw a tab down and over. 
Okay, so we have a we have now at least a close profile, I believe. Oh no, we actually missed a line segment here. Okay, it it goes blue to show that you have a closed profile at least. So now we can fix up a few more things here. I'm going to draw some construction lines for the center lines for our tabs. I'm going to Oh, that's funny. There's a Oh, that is a curious thing. I'm going to actually use the All right. I guess that line segment not quite sure. I'm actually not entirely sure why that ended up as a segment instead of a single point. Um, with an engineering tolerance here, I'm not going to worry about it too much. I'm going to draw a, uh, a construction line from one of those points to the midpoint here, and then I'm going to separately declare it as perpendicular to my baseline. Um, whoops, that went a little further than I wanted. Um, because we're only using the location of the of the slot and not its kind of intrinsic depth at this from this view, um, I'm just going to end up separately dimensioning it at, as the six millimeter thickness, and then also separately dimensioning the tab width, the 15.2, and the root angle at 88, and add one more symmetry constraint, kind of there to there, around there. Okay, and that will be a successful press fit tab. Let's come down now and do something similar. Little triangle means midpoint. That automatically gets me some symmetry relationship. I can make a little working line pull perpendicular. Uh, rather than type the 15.2 in again, I'm going to go zoom out where I can do it equal on the lengths of the ends of the lines. So that they'll, and then I can also make the the uh, put a colon here on the depths of the tabs so I don't have to type the six again. And then all that's left to do is to enforce the symmetry here. Um, once again, I'm just going to type in the 88 again. I think if I was clever, I could construct it geometrically uh, without having to type it. And then we're going to, oop, that actually will make that, that curve ended up not being uh, tangent. We're going to fix that right this second, make the little arc curve tangent there to get a nice curve, and then add a, a symmetry for the roots of our tabs around the center line. And that's at least a viable tab. But now we have an inversion here. We want this to extend a little further down. So it's going to drag it more into place. And I'm going to go ahead and pick a radius for the curve, just just so that it doesn't. Uh, it's easier to drag around. That was not what I wanted to do. I'm going to delete the, delete that dimension and try again. D for dimension. Select the curve. Um, it doesn't really matter much. I'm going to give it a six millimeter exact radius, and then I'm going to uh, put an equality constraint so the two curves have the same radius. That will just and then you keep them uniform. And now I have a I have a remaining freedom in the part. I don't need to quite worry yet about the exact sort of length it goes. In the end, I may want to tie that to some other geometry, but for now, we're just going to leave it as something reasonable and uh, finish the sketch and extrude. And once again, we're going to do the two-sided symmetric, and I'm going to say full width of six millimeters and get a body. And that's that should be a, a um, part that press fits in. Let's now um, look again at what we have. We have the play field and the strut. And if we, if we look at the parts, right, we do, a, we do have a strut that will press fit in. It's not terribly tall, but it's probably enough for now. Um, we left a fairly hefty margin so that the slots have some material thickness there on the outer wall. Um, it's not the most beautiful design, but it will work. If we were willing to use more glue, we might be able to miter that a little more closely and uh, get rid of some of the, you know, but having a nice pounding in slot is good for kind of a hammer fit. Um, let's think now about that cross brace. We want to add one new feature, which I just didn't think about. And the lesson here in some sense is, uh, in my original sketches, I had a top view and a side view, but not an, a lengthwise view. So I hadn't been visualizing the fact that I was going to have this fairly fragile T structure where the top would wobble on a thin strut. Um, so we at least want to think about where we might add like another part. The funny thing is here, if we want the slots tabs to fit in cleanly, the um, the part that we put in, it can't just go right across uh, from this direction because the uh, there's no plane then along which the the laser can cut a, a perpendicular slot at an angle. Um, the slots are going to come out perpendicular to the face. So we have to observe that as a constraint for how we place any kind of bracing here. And effectively, what we want to do is um, basically add in a, uh, unless we want to have a very complicated uh, sort of geometry with a, a slot that's not actually, um, well, we actually could do that, couldn't we? I'm going to actually, I think, uh, leave that for a second video because I want to show one other thing before I close here. Um, let's make a, uh, a view that will allow us to visualize the intersection of the slots. So I can put in a section analysis, and it's actually a top-level feature here, and I can pick a face. 
And what that allows me to do is it puts me in, in a, an, an element into the feature tree, which is in the analysis section. It's a section view that I can turn on and off. And you can have multiple section views. They're actually very handy to define these for your parts so we can come back and look at things. And what that allows us to do then is to come in and sort of visualize the intersection of our various materials here. Remember, we're planning for a press fit. And so we can see now that there's um, some overlap. Kind of see where the section is. Actually, the section here, I'm going to rechange my section plane to be more inside the part. Um, redefine, sorry, section. I'm going to uh, just delete that section and start again. This time I'm going to use the plane that I had created. That was my, my plane that was right through the middle. That'll actually make a better section view. So I'm going to create a section analysis and, and use that plane right on the plane. And I actually just avoided some numerical overflow issues or precision issues to get me a more exact view of my, of my um, turn off the plane. All right, so now I can kind of visualize how those tabs are working up here, right? There's a, there's a little overlap between the root of the tab and the, and the slot that surrounds it. And that will represent a press fit but the material deforms slightly as they're hammered together. And the, the exact choice of that, is, it works in any sort of slightly elastic material. In wood, you can have a particularly forgiving, heavy overfit. It will pound together and compress and make a nice tight fit that often holds together even without glue, um, which can be an advantage for just sort of visualizing things. And if I was to create a section view on the midline of my part, I should be able to see that also apply to the um, central plane. So if we go and just find the world YZ plane, um, I could have also found it down there and create a second inspection section view here. Um, remember, in the analysis, they're both saved as separate items. So we can use them, um, let's leave them there and then come back to them at a later date. If we now look here, we can sort of see that we have um, a, a press fit also for the strut kind of in the, in the bottom plane here and the bottom plane there as well as in the top plane. So that looks sort of fairly reasonable all around. There's some subtle asymmetry there I'm not going to worry about right now. So that is a basic rundown of how I approach the problem of uh, the approach of the drawing of um, several other related parts um, in context using a combination of planes that are defined with respect to sketch features and um, carefully choosing which features of other parts to project into the current sketch to use as reference geometry for defining relationships, trying to keep the parameterization as minimal as possible. So now sort of the final test before this video closes. I'm going to OK it and open up change parameters. And let's just see how successful this is. If I now say that was 15 degrees, but I want it to be 20 degrees, lo and behold, uh, it looks like it worked. Um, my strut was defined with respect to the play field. And so as the play field changes angle, the strut also changes angle. Um, if you recall uh, from before, if I make the play field longer, um, the, uh, the tabs were defined to be have a fixed relationship. So the strut actually doesn't change at all just by making the play field longer. Um, we may want to come back and fix up the def definition of the barriers so that the barriers are actually um, following the length of the play field. And then they themselves would also be redefined to follow the length of the play field. But at first level, we've seen that we have at least some basic ability to manipulate the design parametrically. I'll go back to my previous 15 and 150 and um, have the other parts uh, follow suit. And done carefully, that can allow you quite a bit of design freedom even in the late stage. We'll come back in a separate video to cover the strut and then also um, the copying of the part and export.